Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. Well, good morning. I have this microphone in my hand. Um, as you can see, the, the other mic is having some issues, and it's tough. I'm, I'm Italian, and I like to talk with my hands, and I can now only talk with one hand. Because if I start talking like that, it's not going to work. So, really, it feels strange holding this thing. Um, all right, as you know, we're, we're in a new sermon series uh, on Advent, and I'm not going to go through what Advent is. Um, you, you've, I've, I've wrote about that. If you get our emails, you've seen um, some writing on that. I talked about it last week. Um, but, but essentially, during this season, what we're doing is we're taking time to um, do something that we should be doing as Christians every day, but we're just setting a, a month apart to, to think it through. And um, that idea is that, yes, Christ has come, and we celebrate that on Christmas Day. That's the incarnation. Um, the, the kingdom has been announced. It's been inaugurated. However, we are still waiting for Christ to come again. So this, the title of the sermon series is Waiting for Christ, Preparing for Christ, Hoping in Christ, and Rejoicing in Christ. And, and here's the reality is that even though we're doing each one of these on, on a separate Sunday, we do them all together. You don't wait without hope, and you don't prepare without waiting and hoping. And if we are Christians, we should be rejoicing through all of it. So that's the, the reality. However, we're taking one week um, just to kind of focus in on each one of these. What does it mean this week to be a Christian and to be preparing for the second coming of Christ? What does that mean? You may know the famous hymn, Joy to the World. And there's a line in, in Joy to the World um, that, that I'm sure is very familiar. It's joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. And then the next line is let every heart prepare him room in heaven and nature sing. Now that is from a song and that is not scripture. However, that idea is in scripture and we're going to look at that today, that, that we are, as Christians, we are called to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. And there, there are so many places that we could have gone here. Um, so you might, as the sermon progresses, you're like, hey, he didn't talk about this or this. And there's going to be, you know, parables and, and the words of Christ that we just simply can't get to everything. Um, so forgive me for that. But here's, here's the... Uh, self-reflective question that I would just throw out there to everyone this morning. How do you make room in your own heart to prepare for Christ? How do you do that? May, do you do that? Maybe you don't do that at all. Um, and, and hopefully by the end of this message, I, I will give you reasons why I think that, that you should. Um, but we Christians uh, are what I would call, and, and I've heard other theologians say it, an Advent people. Like this season of Advent is our existence. Um, this is who we are. We live between the tension of what has already happened, the already of the incarnation and Christ coming and all the beautiful gifts that we have and the joy and the hope that we have in that. And the second coming of Christ. We live in a very unique time in human history. And, and you may have never considered that because um, it depends on how far back you, when you think of the history of the world, how far back you go. But there were thousands of years of humanity living before Christ's first coming. But we lived right in between the first 
and the second comings. Okay, so there's that, that already that has happened. Christ has come, and we celebrate that, and, and we're going to sing Christmas songs for the next few weeks, and on Christmas morning, we're going to celebrate Christ has come, that the anointed one, the Messiah, has come. He came, and he announced the kingdom. The kingdom of God is among you, Christ said. And we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us so we can rejoice with true joy and true hope. Now we can be stirred. We can have real victory over sin now. We can have real hope now. But as we looked at last week, the true inheritance is not yet. It hasn't arrived. The final consummation of the kingdom, consummation, the, the, the entry, the completion actually of the, the kingdom has not arrived yet. It is kept in heaven for you if you know Jesus. And one day will descend from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. The new heavens and the new earth, heaven will literally come to earth. And we will see him and we will be like him, and death will be swallowed up. This is the victory that we all look towards, right? That is the victory, and the challenge is to hold these two ideas simultaneously together. This is the essence of the gospel. We're citizens of two ages. We live in the present evil age, which we looked at last week, the Bible is emphatic, saying Satan is the little g God of this world. He's running to and fro. He's been given a certain dominion. But there is an age to come where that will not be the case. And our true home is future. But that future is very real and a very present reality now made real by the Holy Spirit. So again, there's that, that tension. You have the Holy Spirit. You can rejoice. You have eternal life now in the sense that you will never taste death. You will pass from life to life. But we live in the present evil age. Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So um, if you're in here and at some point you heard the word of God and you believed and you might not be able to pinpoint it, but there was a time where the Holy Spirit upon your belief, upon your faith, entered into you and is dwelling inside you. That is the clear teaching of the scriptures. And that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the inheritance. How do you know that that inheritance is real? How do you know that that is coming for you? Is it just blind hope? No, you have God's spirit within you, and it's testifying to the truth of that. Uh, let's look at Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So take that scripture in, in Ephesians, and, and you have this idea that the Holy Spirit is, is coming into you, and, and you can cry out to God because you have the Spirit of Christ in you, Abba, Father, something that you couldn't do before the Spirit of God was dwelling in you. And you're no longer a slave, but an heir, a child of God, a son, a daughter, everything that is the Son. Everything that is Christ is yours. 
And I would just ask you this morning, do you have this assurance? Maybe you're here and, and you don't. Maybe you're in here and you marvel that anyone could be so sure of this gospel message, that there's eternal life and all the things you hear preached and, and read from this pulpit. You, you might be thinking, how can these people be so sure? I remember thinking of that at one point in my life. Like, how can they be so sure, these Christians? The reason that we can be so sure is that we have God's Spirit crying out, Abba, Father. So how do we prepare for the return of Christ? How do we rep- prepare for the return of Christ? John 1, 11 to 13. He, being Jesus, came to his own. And his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So before we, we move on and begin to, to talk to, to, to believers about how do you prepare for Christ, we got to stop here and just say, have you received him? Have you received Christ? And I say that not assuming that everyone in here knows him, not assuming that everyone in here has the the, the Holy Spirit within them crying, Abba, Father. You could be in church and be going through the motions. It's a different thing to have the Spirit of God in your heart crying, Abba, Father. So have you received Christ? Have you rejected Christ? Maybe you haven't rejected him, but you haven't taken the gospel call serious. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. No one is, no one is just. No one is righteous. We all need a Savior. Christ died for your sin. And you, you can't just do nothing with that. You have to, to, to either grapple with it in a way and reject it or accept it and say, yes, he's my Savior and he's my, my Lord too. So have you received Christ? We can't prepare for Christ if we've not yet received him. And to, to the Christians and to those who, who have received Christ, we live in a, in a day and in in an age where um, I, I think within Christianity, many Christians are content upon making their own God, creating their own Jesus. You know, I, I, I want the, you are forgiven words of Christ, but I don't like the go and sin no more words of Christ. Or maybe you love for God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world, and and that's beautiful. But if you keep reading, maybe you've rejected whoever does not believe is condemned. Have you grappled with that, Christian, brother and sister? Do you have the whole Christ? Or do you have an idolatrous Christ? Christ. So that's going to be one of the the places that I'm pushing in here today. Like, how do we prepare for Christ? How do we prepare for a second coming? Well, I would say, make it your effort to know the true Jesus. Do you know the true Jesus? John Piper says this about receiving Jesus. He says, receiving Jesus means receiving Jesus for who he really is. Savior, Lord, like he is Lord. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus is Lord. You cannot say I am a Christian and I follow him, but I'm not going to do anything that he says. That's untenable. He, Jesus' his own words reject that. If you read the Gospels, he said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Receiving Jesus means receiving Jesus for who he really is. Savior, Lord, marriage counselor, vocational counselor, 
therapist, financial planner, nutritional specialist, wardrobe consultant. Try to pick and choose the things about Jesus you find convenient to receive. Rejecting the rest is not to receive Jesus as he really is. So brothers and sisters, that would be just the first, if you, you're a note taker, receive the real Jesus. Because we, uh, I think it was Calvin, it might have been Luther, one of these guys, these old theologians said the human heart is an idol factory. Your heart and my heart constantly are looking for something other to worship than the true and real God, whether that's a job, whether that's money, whether that's power, whether that's control, or whether that is a Jesus of your own making, a Jesus of your own making. To receive Jesus, to have Jesus, is to have all of him. He will have it no other way. And you've heard it <clears throat> said before that when, when we come to faith as Christians, we are not primarily coming to a set of doctrines, although doctrine matters. We're not primarily coming to a worldview, although that is true. Christianity speaks into philosophy. We are not primarily becoming a good person, although that should be the outflow of our faith to be moral and upright and to practice the virtues and not the vices. Christianity is not primarily about any of that. When you come to faith in Christ, you come to a person. It's a relationship. You come to the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God, the king of the world. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, Jesus says this. Again, this... <clears throat> So come to me. This is it. We come to a person. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Brothers and sisters, Christ is the rest for your soul that you need. The whole Christ. Not the manufactured Christ, not the idolatrous Christ that we all, let's be honest, we all can make an idolatrous Christ. We build this image of Jesus, and it's just not the Jesus that's presented in the Word of God. Christ is the true rest for your soul. If your faith is heavy and your faith is burdensome, you're not communing with the real Christ. You might, I'm not saying you don't know Christ, but I'm saying you're, you're off track somehow. If your faith is in not some way taking a heavy load off of you with your works and how you justify yourself, you're not communing with the real Christ. There's freedom in the real Christ. If your faith is becoming about what you do and what you don't do, I do this, I don't do that, you're getting off track. Although all those things matter, our faith is about getting to know a person. And that person is Jesus. So how do we prepare? We receive him, and we spend time with him, and we get to know the real Christ. And our hearts are going to constantly move us to, to take the wheel and, and create a, a new Christ or, or not give him our heavy load and, and say, hey, I want that load back. I want to carry that, Christ. I have two of my kids driving now. And some, for some of the younger kids, that's coming in your, your future and for your parents, it's extremely um, stressful. Just, just know that. Um, my kids are learning that quickly. And I was driving with one of my kids, and you can figure it out, that one kid who doesn't have her license yet and um, hopefully soon will. And we were driving Friday night, and I just, she's not a bad driver. She's decent. And I'm in the passenger seat. I kept 
taking the wheel, which is dangerous, like stupid. She's driving, and I'm like, no, like this way. And it just wasn't, it wasn't right. But I, it was like an instinctual constant of me reaching over and grabbing the wheel. And I, as I was preparing the sermon, I'm like, isn't that what we do with Christ all the time? Right? Like, Jesus, I, I give this to you. I trust you with my life. I, 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 I know, like, you're sovereign. That there's providence. All the things in my life right now that you know you every day that, that I have was written, Psalm 139. You knew every one of them. You know every hair on my head, yet I don't trust. And I want the wheel. And I want the wheel. And... Uh, we have to repent of that. Like, when you think about repentance, do you, do you think about that? Because that's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a, one of the base level sins of lust or, or anything like that. But it, but it is probably most of our, 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 our problem as Christians. We, we just don't trust him. We don't let him take the heavy load and sit and enjoy being children children of God. Mom and dads in here, when you put your children to bed um, at night and, and they're laying down and, and maybe you, you pray with them or maybe you just give them a kiss on, on their head, but there is something in that child's life at that point where they are just completely trusting you and they're not thinking about where the next uh, hundred dollars is coming from, how they're going to pay any bills. You might be carrying that, but that child at that point is completely trusting mom or dad. And that's a picture of what we should do in our faith. So I don't know. Um, well, I do know what many of you are going through, but I don't know what all of you are going through. Trust God. Trust God. All right. If you're a note taker, the next point, how do we prepare Seek biblical truth. Matthew 24, 11 to 13. These are the words of Christ. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So beware of your inclination or the ease of which you are drawn to false teaching. Beware. We all are. And beware of misunderstanding who Jesus is, misunderstanding who God is, and your life. Paul tells Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. They're, they're related. And here we see false prophets leading people astray and lawlessness increasing. False teachers leading people astray, lawlessness increasing. If you think about the age that, that we all find ourselves in, the last three years have, have been a pretty crazy time. Um, and, and there's a lot going on in our culture right now. In some sense, again, nothing new under the sun, but in, in some sense, some of these things are, are new, at least in our day and, and age. But if you think about it, it's nothing but lawlessness. When God gives a man and a woman their basic biological framework and and we say, uh-uh, God, I'm not this, I want to be that. That's lawlessness. That's lawlessness. When God says a man and a woman are to be married, and, and that's what marriage is, and we say, uh-uh, no, we're going to do it this way. That's lawlessness. When we murder children in the womb, that's lawlessness. We live in a day and an age where lawlessness is seemingly increasing. And the false prophets are increasing. And that's a whole other story. But 
Beware where you feed from as a Christian. Beware where you feed from as a Christian. Uh, I have a quote, and I'm not exactly sure who said, said this, but I thought it was appropriate. It's about this idea of lawlessness. You do whatever you think you want to do. You are a law to yourself. Now, before we point the finger at, at others and say, oh, look at everyone out there, we have to also look at our own hearts and say, where am I trying to be a law to my own self? That's what Jesus means by lawlessness. And it's multiplied and increased. And Jesus says such lawlessness will be multiply, multiplied, will be increased, and that the effect is a tragic coldness of love among Christians. Have you ever experienced this in your walk? You know you, you shouldn't be doing something, and you start flirting with it, and then you take another step into it, and maybe another step into it. And sooner or later, eh, I don't really want to read the Bible. I don't really want to be at church. That is exactly what Jesus is, is framing here, that, that beware, beware. False prophets are going to lead you astray. And hey, it, you know, they're in the church, they're outside of the church, there's false teaching everywhere. Beware. But lest we become a Pharisee and say, thank you, God, that I am not like all those people out there, we have to look in our own hearts. So here are just, again, some, some self-diagnostic questions. Where are you prone? Where are you prone to not believe the Scripture? What are those pieces of, of, of Scripture where you're like, I just, I, I think that's, that was for another culture, another day, another age. That's not for today. And you kind of write it off. And I would just submit to you that, that that's, that's your heart that's a lawless way of thinking. Or in your relationships, where are you prone to lawlessness? Is it with a boss or is it with a husband? Is it with authority figures? Where are you prone to lawlessness? We all are. I mean, that's, we, we all have that rebellious spirit within us, and we have to confess, and we have to, to see it for what it is, because if we run down that road, there's nothing good at the end of it. Or maybe your, your lawlessness is just playing out. You're, you're creating your own God. Your Jesus is nothing. Wouldn't even, if you set your Jesus next to the Jesus of the Bible, they wouldn't even be in the same ballpark. Where are you prone to lawlessness? Are you intentionally getting to know Christ? That's also a form of lawlessness. Like, hey, I don't want to read this or I don't want to listen to the scriptures because I know I'll be convicted if I do. That's lawlessness. And we have to recognize that. So are you intentionally getting to know the real Christ by seeking biblical truth. That's another way that we prepare. And we're to worship on the Lord's Day and, and sit under the preached word, the sang word, the prayed word, the gathering, the, uh, the, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then on your own, the spiritual disciplines. Are you leaning into any of the disciplines? Prayer, fasting, meditating on God's word, silence, solitude. And you might be thinking, that sounds, Pastor, just like legalism. I don't want legalism in my faith. And I would just push back on it and say, no, this is discipline. Everything else you do in life, your job, your, whatever you're doing, you have to maintain discipline to get fruit from it. And the same goes for your faith. The same goes for your faith. So um, are you taking the gathering of the church serious? And are you taking the spiritual disciplines serious? And if this sounds like work, I would say that could be an indication. Maybe not. But it could be an indication that you're, the relational part of Christ is not there. Because really, a relationship with God is going to make you want to obey God, as opposed to, I have to obey God for him to be happy. Um, 
or for me to, to have right standing before God. Don Whitney, uh, he, he wrote a great book on, on spiritual disciplines, and there's a, a quote here, um, and, and it's about worship. And this is why it all matters, because it all, when you got the wrong God, you're not worshiping the right God, and nothing's happening in your heart. You might be kind of getting a little emotional about things and, and getting excited about the music, but if you got the wrong God or your God is skewed too much, your, your worship is not where it needs to be. And Whitney says this, we are to worship according to the truth of Scripture. We worship God as he is revealed in the Bible, not as we might want him to be. Think about that for a moment. Not as we might want him to be. We worship him as a God of both mercy and justice, of love and wrath, a God who both welcomes into heaven and condemns into hell. We are to worship in response to truth. If we don't, we worship in vain. We worship in vain. So how do we prepare for Christ? We seek biblical truth. We seek to know the real Christ who one day we will see face to face. Prepare. How else do we prepare? In the New Testament, it opens up with a figure, a person, um, front and center. Anyone have any idea who that person is? I mean, you can say Jesus and be right, but other than Jesus, who is the, there's a, there's a figure, a person that the Bible opens up with in the Gospels. And it seems to be the light shining on him for a moment. John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, yes. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the last of the Hebrew prophets. Jesus said that of, of men born from women, there is none greater than John the Baptist, and that is most likely because he is literally the prophet. Now think about up until his time, you've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Michael, they're all, or Micah, they're all saying, hey, there's one to come. There's, a, there's a, a Messiah coming, an anointed one. He is coming, and you're going to find hope in him, and he's going to right all the wrongs, and they're announcing the coming of the Messiah. And John the Baptist gets to literally announce him while he is on earth. So John the Baptist, in that sense, is just has a great role as one of the, the, the last Hebrew prophet with one of the most distinguished roles of the prophet. In fact, Isaiah says this in verse, or chapter 40, verses 3 to 5 of John. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should, shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this is Isaiah saying, hey, there's one to come, and, and we know this is John the Baptist. He's to come, and he's preparing the way for the Lord. So again, today's sermon is on preparation. How do we prepare for the Lord? Well, we should probably look. What was John's message then for the first coming on how did they prepare for the Lord? And we see that. You'll see that in, in, in the Gospels, Matthew 3.1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what was his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ. He's preaching out there in the Judean wilderness, and he's preaching a gospel of repentance. Because the Lord is coming. You're going to see him face to face pretty soon. Stop doing all that nonsense. Repent. Turn. And as we consider this time in, in, in this Advent series, and, and especially as we think through 
How do we prepare? Christ could come at any moment. How do we prepare to not see him when he comes and be filled with shame and guilt because our, our minds and our actions were in the gutter or they, our hearts were far from him and cold? How do we prepare? And, and I would just say one of the other ways to prepare is to be a Christian who repents. And I know that's not always a popular message within Christianity. Repent. In fact, you'll, you'll see it, 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 some it, people on a street corner yelling at people, telling them to repent. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus, John, Matthew, Luke, Paul, Peter, Jude, they all are preaching it. You can't get around it. The only way you can get around it is not reading the Bible to get around repentance. Some of you may know this story, and, and, and some may not. Um, in, in the 1500s, there was a man uh, by the name of Martin Luther. He was a German man. And Luther, at one point, becomes a monk. And when he becomes a monk, he has access now to the, to the scriptures. So the people did not have access to the scriptures. And he started reading the scriptures and he started seeing, man, the church, the way that the church is operating is nothing like the way that it's described in the Bible. And at this point, you've got the sale of indulgences, you've got the abuse of power, you've got the scriptures withheld from the, the common man and woman. You've got salvation being taught by something you do rather than being received by grace through faith. And he looks at all of this and he says, this is really wrong here. We need to, to fix this. He, he didn't want to move away from the church at that time. He simply wanted to reform the church. He had a heart for the scriptures. So in 1517, Martin Luther, a young Martin Luther, he writes what is famously known as the 95 Thesis. And it was just... We're doing this, we need to be doing this. This is not what this is, this is what this is. And, and it, it's, you can, can read it on your own, and I, I know some of you have read it. And he writes these 95 theses, and he nails them to the local church in Wittenberg. And the world has never been the same. Everything you know and I know about reality is because of that moment. And, and I could get into to why that's a whole nother, that's not a sermon, but a, a teaching. Everything you and I know as reality is spilled out of the Reformation in the 1500s. And he writes these 95 theses. Thesis number one. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, Matthew 4, 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. If you are a Christian, you should be marked by repentance. It's the substance of your faith. Humility. Repentance. Seeing, looking into your own heart and seeing where you fall short. Instead of looking at everyone else and seeing where they fall short, looking at yourself and seeing where you fall short. Repentance is turning from sin and trusting in Christ. And as a Christian, this happens throughout your walk, day in and day out. I've yelled at my kids more than once in the last week. Sometimes it was 100% right and righteous. Other times, it was not. And I have to own that. I own that. And I go to my kids and say, hey, I need Jesus just as much as you need Jesus. I shouldn't have said that. My, how many times I have to do that, especially with my son. <laughs> we are a people a repentant people. 
Okay, we have victory. We have the victory. But if you live your life and, and, and don't look at your own heart and your own actions and are not repentant, you're, you're not walking in the light. You're walking in darkness. You, that's the tension that we're talking about, the already and the not yet. You can have the victory, but the victory is going to include daily repentance. And brothers and sisters, this is sanctification. This is what the Bible calls conforming to the image of Christ. That is going to happen over a very long time. We all just want it now, right? I want it now, and, but you're going to fall. You're going to sin. It's going to happen today. It's going to happen Monday morning. It's going to happen Tuesday morning. It might happen in a bigger way a month from now. It's going to happen. The question is, what are you going to do when it does? There's two places we can go. Number one, excuse it, justify it. Ignore it, depending on what kind of sin it is. Or we admit it. And we're washed and we're cleansed. And the sweet grace of our Savior comes upon us. This is what John is talking about in 1 John. 1 John 1, 6 to 10. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And here it is. Listen closely here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all sin unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. So just let those words, when we talk about repentance, and and again, how do we prepare for the second coming of Christ? Repent. But repentance is not some nasty thing for the Christian. It's actually sweet. He cleanses us. He forgives us. But if we walk around saying, no, that's not sin. I haven't sinned. This is pretty strong. He's saying, we're making God out to be a liar at that point. So brothers and sisters, when you fail, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? And I would submit to you this morning that repentance is just another way to prepare for the coming of Christ. Be a repentant person. If you are here and you have a family, multiple people in your your home, you know that there needs to be a lot of forgiveness. Love covers a multitude of sins, but there needs to be confession. If somebody is doing something to you and they will not own up to it, there can be no relationship there. And the same goes for you and God. If you're sinning against God and you are denying that you're in sin or trying to ignore it, you have fractured the relationship. You can know him. You can have salvation, but you, you are fracturing your communion with the Lord at that point. So we are about to take communion today. We're we'll take the, what, what is called the, the Lord's Supper. Um, and I would just say, as, as a church, let's, let's think, let's, let's ponder our hearts and our lives before we eat and drink together. Um, another way that, that we prepare for the coming of Christ is, is the gathering. Um, you hear that from me quite a bit. Um, God has means of grace, and, and this is one of them. It's the preached word, the sang word, the prayed word, the gathering of, of the saints, the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. That, that is what he has commanded to do for his people, and there is grace in that. And then, then there's other things. He, he, again, like we, we said before, reading your Bible, prayer. And I would just say to you, okay, I, I can't guarantee that if you pick up your Bible and read it, that you're going to be stirred by God. But here's what I can guarantee. If you don't, you won't be. 
And, and that goes for listening, too. So if you're like, I'm not a reader, well, listen, listen. we can listen to the Bible now. I can't guarantee that if you make an effort daily or, or, or just in a concerted effort in your life to pray and to set a time aside to pray, I can't guarantee that you're going to have explosive intimacy with God. But I can guarantee if you don't pray that you won't. I can't guarantee that you're going to be moved and enlightened by every Sunday that we have church here. But I can guarantee that if you don't come to church at all, that your heart will grow cold. I can guarantee that. So God has given us these means of grace to stir our hearts and to move our hearts towards him because, again, our hearts are idle factories. They are constantly going to be moving towards something else and to take the place that only God can take. Uh, Of of these means of grace, Ray Ortland says this, Our gracious Lord is not playing catch me if you can with us. He has made himself knowable and accessible in specific ways of his own wise choosing. His appointed avenues of blessing are the means of grace. His chosen means is where he has concentrated his availability. So just for a moment, he's available. You can walk in the woods. You can, you can pray to God. He's available. But like a gushing fountain of mercy for sinners who are so desperate that they are finally coming to Christ on his terms. What Ortland is describing is Bible reading, prayer, the gathering, all of the means of grace that, that the preached word of God the prayed word of God, the saying word of God. So another way that we prepare for the coming of Christ is by leaning into the means of grace that God gives us. It's very clear in the scriptures. So we're about to do communion here, and uh, I would just say this this is for believers. If you call yourself a Christian, that Jesus is your Lord and and his Savior, this is for you. If you're not there, I would just say we would ask you to pass. Um, This is an ordinance or a sacrament um, that is given by Christ for his people to take by faith and commune with him. So there's nothing magic in the bread or the juice that we're going to drink, but Christ has ordained this very thing, the Lord's table, to bring us closer to him, but only by faith, only by faith. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit vintagefaithcicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.